introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Raylene Crandall. Um, so she um, started, so she completed an MS at uh, Oklahoma State University and she got her PhD at Louisiana State University and then had a postdoctoral fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis before beginning her appointment here um, at UF in the School of Forest Fisheries and Geomatic Sciences. And throughout Dr. Crandall's career, her interests have remained focused on understanding how interacting disturbances affect plant population dynamics. So she's going to be giving us a presentation today called Tales of Plants that Thrive Where Fire and Water Collide. So thank you again so much for being here. Thank you, Allison. I'm really excited to give this seminar today because people will often ask me, so what do you do? We, we know you light things on fire, but what else do you do? So I'm really excited to tell everyone what else I do. Um, so I'm gonna give you a background, a brief background to start. Um, fire has a really long history on earth. In fact, we know from charcoal records that fire appeared shortly after other plants. And so plants and fire have evolved together, but despite this long history, our capacity to manage natural systems using fire remains rather imperfect. In fact, when I was growing up, I didn't even know that fire was an important part of many systems. And I was not exposed to this until I was an undergraduate um, at Butler University in Indianapolis. The, um, Nature Conservancy, when I was an undergraduate, invited me to participate in a burn. And this was, the burn was for a prairie that was right beside behind the building that I was working in. And I thought, well, what is this? I don't, don't really know much about fire. I don't know much about burning. Um, but I went to join them and little did I know that they were gonna put me in a full yellow, what's called a banana suit made of um, fire retardant Nomax and put a drip torch in my hand that had um, gasoline, a mixture of gasoline and diesel. And they were actually gonna let me light the fire. And since then I was hooked on fire and excited to learn more about it. Well, the prairie that I helped burn was right behind the biology building. And so going a little bit out of my way each day, I was able to watch that prairie come back to life. And it's not much unlike what we see here in our southeastern pine savannas, that after we burn, our plants have the capacity to grow very quickly. Um, you know, just a couple weeks post fire, we see things like um, Arista bayrickiana here, this grass that has recovered quite quickly. We see the diversity in frequently burned systems, just three months post fire with plants flowering and pollinators being very abundant. This is what got me really hooked on asking questions about the effects of fire in biodiverse systems and certainly something that I've continued to do today. But shortly after I graduated with my bachelor's degree, I found myself working in fire suppressed systems first as a botanist and then working as a wildland uh, firefighter out west. And although we did light some fires, the bottom picture is actually of me lighting um, a prescribed fire in Colorado, mostly what we did was suppress fires. Now I had learned as an undergrad how important fires were for maintaining these systems. So it was really difficult, honestly, for me to work in some of these systems and see the low biodiversity in the understory and realize that they needed fire, but yet we were putting out the fires, we were suppressing the fires. So after a couple of years of being a wildland firefighter, I began uh, going through college and working towards my current goal. And that is to put more fire on the ground by teaching students how to light safe, ecologically appropriate fires. So now at the University of Florida, about 20 to 40 students each year go, go through uh, my program, my classes, and they earn their type one or type two wildland uh, firefighter certificate. It can be a little scary sometimes, I'll be honest, to have you know anywhere between 10 and 
20 students that are new to fire um, out on the fire line and lighting fires, but um, very rewarding because they're learning on the ground how to light these fires. And they're taking the skill then into their jobs and promoting the use of good fire. Now, I wanna be clear that the fire that I'm talking about today are prescribed fires. These are fires that we've planned. We have a written prescription, just like you know, your doctor would write a prescription for you. So we're evaluating the conditions, the fuels, we're writing objectives. So you know, our areas in one condition, we may wanna be maintaining that condition or moving to a different condition. And we're planning our fires based on that. Our fires, we plan them so they stay in a confined area also. Um, and so, as I said, it's a prescribed, um, a prescribed burn. And I, I'm not currently studying any wildfires, so only prescribed burns. And let me show you what this looks like uh, from a recent burn out at Austin Carey Forest. So these are shrub vegetation or fuels in a pine savanna. So fairly low intensity fire. Historically, uh, fires were lit by Native Americans and lightning. Of course, now we help them along with our prescribed fires. Fires would have occurred during every season. Um, you know, Native Americans would have lit fires for, you know, hunting to clear their way for traveling, for crop management, um, pest reduction, maybe, you know, uh, ticks, reduction of ticks and things like that. Um, and then lightning ignited fires would have occurred during the transition between the dry season or most often during the transition from the dry season into the wet season. So what I'm showing you here on the first y-axis is the cumulative rainfall anomaly. And when it hits a minimum here is the transition into the wet season. So you can see the wet season there. And when it hits the maximum is a transition into the dry season. So when the dry season transitions into the wet season is when we see the onset of more lightning. And this is when lightning ignited fires would be more frequent and they would burn uh, larger areas, but of course we would get lightning ignited fires throughout this time. The seasons that we have here, those wet and dry seasons are relatively predictable and they affect the water table along elevational gradients. Such that during the dry season, we have less standing water in many areas as you see in this bottom photo here, but during the wet season, often we have standing water, especially in low-lying areas. In, in Florida and in a lot of coastal areas, very gradual transitions or changes in elevation um, will really affect whether we have standing water during much of the year, and especially during the wet season. These subtle gradients in topography, which affects you know, soil moisture and standing water, also will have an effect on whether or not fire burns and then create interactions between fire and water across seasons and across time. So for instance, if you consider this little diagram here to the left, you'll see that in the most recent burn, these patches and kind of a reddish pink burned, but if you consider over a longer term and maybe the last four fires, you see that there are some patches that only burned once in the most recent fire, others that have burned two times, and then in fact, others that have burned up to four times. And what we call this variation over space and time is pyrodiversity. Pyrodiversity is important in many of our systems and is often studied at a larger, landscape sort of level, but in coastal systems that are really affected by the seasonal changes in, um, in water, we know that subtle, or subtle 
elevational gradients can result in small scale pyrodiversity. So what I'm showing you here is just about two meters here along the bottom and then up and down about one meter. And just a subtle change in the elevation has caused the fire to stop. No real major change in vegetation, but we sometimes also see that as we have changes um, in elevation and in water or soil moisture. Pyrodiversity also increases biotic diversity because of that variation over space and time in the frequency of fire. And then we also know that pyrodiversity increases the coexistence of plants that have different life histories. When I was working on my PhD, I had my first experiences with looking at some of these small scale interactions between water and fire. Sorry, my computer's glitching a little. And I went to the Florida Panhandle and met with a land manager there. Some of you may know uh, Jean Huffman. Jean had promised to show me dunes and swales along the coast. And I was really excited because I grew up in Northern Indiana where we would go to the Indiana, um, or go to the Indiana National Lakeshore where the dunes were stories high. Well, we walked around and walked around and walked around all day. And I asked Jean very excitedly, can we go see the dunes now? And she said, well, you're standing on them. These are the dunes. Um, well, I got even more excited than I would have if they were two stories high, because I realized that what I was standing on are these really gradual transitions. And in closer inspection, found that there were species of hypericum that had different life histories, and they were sorting along these elevational gradients. In the more upland area was Hypericum microsepalum. This one is an obligate re-sprouter. This species will flower one to two years after fire. After fire, it also will re-sprout. So it doesn't necessarily need to flower in order to persist, certainly for genetic diversity and other reasons, but not to persist in the area. At the other end of the spectrum is an obligate reseeder. Even with low intensity fires, obligate reseeders are killed and they must regenerate from seed. Now these are woody species. This obligate reseeder takes more than 10 years to reach reproductive maturity in many habitats. So you can imagine it takes a really long time for, or needs a really long time between fires. And this is a system that burns every two to three years. Between the two is the facultative reseeder resprouter. With low intensity fires, it's able to resprout after fire, but with higher intensity fires, it tends to reseed. And then all three species actually coexist with the facultative reseeder resprouter. So here is this system where in the more upland area where the obligate reseeder resprouter occurs, fire is more frequent it's drier. In the more lowland area where the obligate reseeder persists, it's much wetter and it doesn't burn as frequently. And so because of that, the obligate reseeder is able to persist in that area. If fires were to become more frequent, say more frequent than the obligate reseeder was able to grow to reproductive maturity, eventually the seed bank would be exhausted and um, the obligate receiver would be uh, eliminated from that area, unless, of course, there was recruitment or um, unless seeds came in from other areas. In the center, where we find the facultative receiver resprouter, the fires are very heterogeneous. And so that's why we see all three of these species co occurring in the center area along these gradual transitions. Thinking about some of these early ideas um, when I was a graduate student and these questions of how fire and water can interact has really guided a lot of the questions that I've asked since then. My, I was just adding it up this morning. Um, my lab uh, has <laughs> 
uh, has looked at about 30 plant populations to examine some of these interactions between multiple disturbances, uh, mostly fire and water. Beginning with uh, my PhD studies on three species of Hypericum. Of course, I can't talk to you about all 30 today. So I'm going to talk to you about two, uh, pineland croton or croton linearis, and then Caribbean pine or Pinus caribea. And I'm going to start with pineland croton. So pineland croton occurs in pine rocklands in South Florida, um, mainly in Everglades uh, National Park, but in, in other pine rocklands also. When you look at pine rocklands, they don't look that much different from the pine savannas that we see near Gainesville, Florida. But at closer inspection, we find that it has a rocky substrate of limestone, which you can see here in the lower left, and an overstory of South Florida slash. Understory of palmetto shrubs and a very high native biodiversity. It has seasonal um, inundation, especially in more lowland areas, although it has these gradual transitions so that it's not abrupt. And there are patches that are wetter and patches that are drier. This area is burned every three years uh, when possible, but has gone through some periods of fire suppression. Most of the pine rocklands are within Everglades National Park, but there are some areas that are scattered outside of the park. Uh, Pineland croton, or I'll just call it croton, is uh, fairly frequent in pine rocklands along the edges of the seasonally flooded prairies that are there. It will persist in standing water. It typically produces male and female flowers on separate plants, sometimes, not always. It doesn't always read the guidebooks. After a fire, it typically re-sprouts from the root crown. It will even grow within the rock, pretty amazing. And one of the reasons that we're so interested in this plant and studying it is that it's the host plant for two endangered butterflies, Bartram's hair streak up here on the top, and then the Florida uh, leaf wing butterfly here on the bottom. So although, Croton itself is quite rare, it's not listed as endangered. Um, because it is the host plant to these two endangered butterflies, it's important that we monitor it and um, examine its management to make sure that we're promoting population growth of this species. Bartram's hair streak um, in particular um, doesn't venture very far from Croton maybe five meters. So it's thought that if we lose a population of croton, we could potentially lose a population of the Bartram's hair streak. Now I'm not an entomologist. You'll have to ask an entomologist more questions about um, the butterflies, but I can tell you a bit about croton linearis and how it's affected by interactions between fire and water. So a little bit about fire in the park. It's um, been fairly common through most of the history of the park, but there was 10 years of fire suppression when they didn't have a management plan, fire management plan in place. Fire has been reintroduced to most of the areas, but not all of them. There's, oops, sorry. There's also been large scale um, hydrological restoration that's been part of the uh, Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Project or SERP. Water in the South Florida, you know, is a complicated thing. It, it once flowed very freely from the Kissimmee River to Lake Okeechobee and then southward over uh, low lying areas. It was a sheet of water that flowed into the Everglades. And when early settlers arrived in Florida, they saw that area as a great place to settle and to develop agriculture. And so they put in uh, levees and dams and rerouted a lot of that water. Well, in 2000, 
Congress developed SERP and the purpose of that was to reintroduce a lot of the water into South Florida and develop that sheet flow again into the Everglades and other areas in South Florida, as you can see here. So a drastic change from the historic to the current, to the plan. Now, with changes in hydrology um, and changes in fire with 10 years of fire suppression and reintroducing it, there have been some changes in the croton populations. Some of them are declining, others are increasing, but there just weren't these super clear patterns as to what was happening with the croton. And so in we come <laughs> to try to answer some questions for the managers in the area. They had been collecting data on croton for quite a long time. And then we've been supplementing some of that, those data to try to get some more small scale information on what's been happening with these populations. And so I'm gonna show you what we've found kind of in a nutshell. We've found that prescribed burns during different seasons affect the survival of croton. So if you consider a plant pre-fire over left, if you burn, well before the wet season begins, the croton is able to regrow and get beyond the water level before the waters start to increase because of the wet season, or this could be because of water releases. So as long as the plants have sufficient time to grow before the water levels rise, their survival is about 84%. So if you burn near the wet season onset so that the plants do not have enough time to grow before the waters start increasing, then there's high mortality and only about 4% survival. The reason for that mortality, we don't know, but it's likely plant inundation before the plants are able to regrow and become tall enough and reach a point where they're above the water. Now sort of add, insult to injury, those plants that are in lower areas, lower elevation, actually grow slower. So they need more time between um, burning and the wet season onset. If you burn after the wet season has already started and the water levels have, have risen, then survival is about the same as that when you burn before the wet season onset, but you have enough time for those plants to grow. This is because the water levels have already risen, you know, and to their maximum level or so. And then fires will actually burn right over the water as long as the fuels or the vegetation are connected or, or close enough together to carry the fire. The fires are also really patchy if you burn after the wet season onset. So there are also plants that just survive the fires in that case. So we found, what we found here is this interaction between fire and water where you have to time the fire in relationship to either the wet season or water releases to make sure that the plants can stay above the water. They're able to grow, they're able to persist above the water. While these results aren't unusual, there's similar results reported for sawgrass in marshes. Researchers have found that burning immediately before the water levels rise increases mortality, but there's a big difference between sawgrass and croton. Sawgrass only needs about 10 days to increase the likelihood of escaping rising water, whereas croton needs very significantly longer than that. Croton only grows about 30 centimeters. Um, you know, in a, in a year, whereas um, colms of sawgrass can grow 2.1 centimeters a day. So big difference there. If you're interested in learning more about fire in the Everglades, I encourage you to check out Into Nature Films. Uh, fire Swamp in particular is a really good one. Uh, great documentaries about fire. So our conclusion 
to this is that fire timing should be considered in conjunction with the wet season onset and also planned water releases. Just being aware that these plants need time to recover or burning needs to be done when the plants, um, when the water has already risen so that you don't have concerns with the plants um, drowning when the water levels rise. So the other plant that I wanna talk about is Caribbean pine. And for this one, I'm gonna take you down to um, pine savannas near uh, Punta Gorda in Paynes Creek National Park. So Dr. Jennifer Phil um, was contacted by some researchers and land managers um, in South Belize. And they were asking, why are there more pines in our lowland pine savannas? And so we teamed up with them to ask this question. These pine savannas are really cool. One of the reasons for that is that they are maintained by both fire and flooding. If you take out fire, they still persist. And that is because they also have this flooding disturbance. So they don't convert to, you know, shrublands or whatnot if you take out fire because they still have these recurrent flooding disturbances. Um, we haven't had an instance of removing flooding, so I'm not sure what effect that would have, but it was really interesting to us that they could be maintained without fire, but likely it's the interaction between the two of these that have an effect on biodiversity and such um, in these lowland pine savannas, and they're right along the coast. Pine savanna themselves, uh, we think of them as having this diverse understory dominated by grasses and then trees um, in the overstory. Well-spaced trees, mainly, you know, the understory herbaceous layer, trees might be in patches, but those trees, they are important. They sequester carbon, they increase soil moisture, they increase nutrients, uh, and they promote heterogeneous fires. So they are important in these systems. And it was interesting to us to think about, well, why might we not be seeing a lot of recruitment of these pines? So we teamed up with the um, Darwin Project and the University of Belize to look at some data and put in plots that determines what's limiting the success of pines in Belizean lowland pine savannas. We tagged and mapped pines in both shrubby and open environments, and we burned them, quantified the fire intensity by looking at char height on trees, and we measured their fire responses, survival, growth, reproduction. And you can see down here is one of our little tagged plants. Uh, so Caribbean pine is really neat because it re-sprouts after fire. So some of these short little plants are actually have re-sprouted several times after fire. You look down at the base, you can see um, evidence that they've been burned in the past. And it was a lot of fun to burn in Belize. Um, they asked us what kind of fire we want. I've never been asked that before. Uh, so we were able to do just a point um, source ignition. We just threw a match down and it burned wherever it burned. Um, and I'm going to show you a video of what it looks like. And this is one of our tag plants here. You can see how slowly the fire moves. All right, the video is a little shaky because I was starting to get a little hot standing there. So I kept moving a little further away from the fire. Burns right up to the pine. If you look closely, you can see some of the moisture being um, driven out of the pine needles.
so when we go back the next day, uh, we can actually look at the buds and if they're green, they've survived. If not, they haven't. Uh, a lot of our plants, most of our plants did not actually survive our experimental fires, but a few did. And so when we um, started going through our data and asking how fire did affect the juvenile Caribbean pines, what we first discovered is that there just aren't a whole lot. There are not many recruits. We combined data actually between multiple years and multiple fires, even to get large enough sample sizes to begin looking at survival of these pines. What we found is that fire intensity in the open area and the shrubby area were both pretty moderate. Char heights were similar on the trees, about one to three meters. But the heterogene heterogeneity in the open area was pretty low. So the fires covered a larger, more continuous area than in the shrubby area where those fires were really patchy. When we looked at the proportion surviving, we looked at, looked at it, ended up looking at it over two years. And with fire, proportion surviving was 0.02 in the open and 0.31 in the shrubby, and without fire, 0.4 and 0.38. So pretty similar in the two without fire, but higher in the shrubby with fire. And that's likely because they just didn't burn. They were able to escape fire because those fires were patchier. So from this study, we found that pines have high mortality until they reach about 50 centimeters. And this is really regardless um, of fire, but especially in those shrubby habitats or shrubby environments. Uh, vegetation patchiness increases the likelihood that individuals are gonna escape fire. But regardless, we didn't even find many individuals. There were not many seedlings that were recruiting. And it was very patchy across the landscape. So even to find adult plants and to look near those adult plants for recruitment, we had to hike um, you know, fairly long distances between them. So it was very, very patchy. Now we did do some demographic modeling on this and found that the population growth rate was about one. So we would call that stasis or you know, not growing or shrinking. So then it means that the adults are really important. If you lose adults in this system, then you, the pines lose then their ability to make seedlings. So it's really important to protect the adults. But there are some threats to those adults that need to be addressed. The first is that there are poachers who cut the trees to collect the yellow-headed parrot. Sorry, my slide is, there we go. Um, so the yellow-headed parrot is a popular pet. It's a great talker but it's poached for the international pet trade and it's driven the species to near extinction in the wild. Poachers don't climb the trees and get the birds out of their nest. They cut down the whole tree. It's crazy. Uh, most of the birds don't even survive uh, the collection process by these poachers, but they make so much money off of the birds that they continue doing it. And so a lot of the adult trees in the system have actually been lost to the poachers. So they're trying to ameliorate, ameliorate that by actually collecting the birds themselves. So they now have a program where when the, um, the birds hatch, they themselves, the rangers and managers in this area, climb the trees and they collect the birds, they raise them in captivity, and then they re-release the birds. So that's really improved the populations of the yellow-headed parrots, and it's also protected the trees. This area does ha also have rare but intense hurricanes. It's right along the coast. It could be that the area has inappropriate fire regimes. 
uh, which could create an interaction um, with the grasses that are there. So more frequent fires could you know, increase grass abundance, for example, is something that we're testing, and then um, provide additional competition with trees during early recruitment. A lot of these areas are not necessarily prescribed burns, but they're wildfires. So locals will light these areas on fire because know that burning increases acorn production, which you know, attracts animals for hunting. Um, you know, they'll also light fires to help with traveling across the landscape. These grasses are really hard to walk through. So lighting fires, you know, helps for traveling and such. And they'll just light fires to light fires. It's fun to light fires. Um, so sometimes these areas burn more than once a year. It could also be that these trees don't have the ectomycorrhizal fungi that they need to form relationships during early recruitment especially considering there's such a strong cycle of flooding during the wet season that these fungi may not be able to survive the flooding for six months or so of each year. Another possibility is that there might be low genetic diversity of these trees. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead here. Is the birds. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Being a little glitchy. Um, it could also be that these trees have low genetic diversity. Um, these pine cones are only receptive for about two weeks. Being along the coast, there's also prevailing winds. So if there's a relative upwind and that's the only tree that's upwind, then these cones aren't gonna get pollinated. And this is something else that we're exploring in the future. So we still have a lot of questions. We have a lot of things to explore in this system. Right now we've established a lot of the patterns and we're looking to mechanisms for what might be causing the lack of recruitment. But we're also considering the fact that this could just be normal. This could be um, a fact of this tree. So it could be that low survival of seedling and juvenile pines is, is normal. It's part of this plant's life history. But because a lot of the adult trees have been um, you know, removed by poachers and, and other things, we're seeing even lower recruitment or availability of seeds. So my lab certainly, um, wow, it's just going, sorry. <laughs> so I just told you a couple of stories. Um, and my lab certainly has a lot. We welcome collaborations on, you know, any of these species that folks might be interested in. And we certainly can't look at mechanisms without help from others. Um, and if you're interested in any of these or study any of these, uh, please reach out to us. Some people ask me, you study all these different species, you know, wh why do you do that? How do you pick these species? Why any species, um, you know, how do you, how do you decide? And, um, you know, what makes these spe special? And, you know, I have to say each plant has a really unique story. They have a unique relationship with, or unique relationships with other species. And it's these relationships that really help us understand different patterns at larger spatial scales. You know, we also fit these often into our models of communities to look at how changes in, in one species or the abundance of one species might have, have an effect on other species. So in that case, they can really serve as harbinger, harbingers of future changes and help us adapt our management. A lot of our species are also identified 
by land managers. And we work very closely in co-production of our research with land managers. We help them um, work on a lot of these species to develop adaptive management plans. They help us identify those species that are important, that are either sensitive or economically important for population monitoring. Um, and fortunately, our, our land managers often recognize the importance of these single species studies. Uh, journals often don't. It's, it can be a challenge sometimes to publish studies on a single species uh, of plant. If you study polar bears, you're probably in luck. Um, but plants are much more difficult. Um, and then you know, our work with, with fire practitioners and land managers also helps us prioritize and incorporate research into the future. And especially that research that incorporates future changes in climate. And we know that our dry season is becoming longer. We're having a greater overlap with our um, lightning ignited fire season. And all of this has an effect on how do we manage with fire and how do we manage that interaction between fire and water. And this is just a fraction of the folks that have been involved um, in a lot of this research. And I'm happy to take questions now or questions in the future if you think of something later. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. I actually do have a question um, uh, just to like sort of start off, um, which is where when you I think you were touching on this just like a couple of slides ago, but like with the Pineland Croton, like I can totally see what you're saying about, you know, like lighting the fires too close to the wet season has these different impacts. And then you were saying that, um, uh, you know, basically like, you know, there's different, you know, sort of needs like in terms of fire and water for different plants. So do you ever run across this situation where, okay, so this might be an ideal time to light a fire for this particular plant, but this time is also like really negative for another species? Yeah, we haven't run into that yet, but we have found that some species have different sensitivities to either fire or water. I mean, for instance, um, we're studying one grass that um, it's actually really, it's really neat. I couldn't decide if I should tell this story or not. It forms plantlets. So it, it co-occurs with croton and it forms plantlets at the top and it's not as sensitive to flooding after fire, but it is sensitive to extended flooding. So if there's flooding, when it has its little plantlets at the top, the plant actually falls over with the plantlet still attached and then grow new plants. Mm. And that's a cycle it has each year. So if it's flooding and there's standing water when there's plantlets on the plant, then it can't connect with the ground. It can't root into the ground. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, it's not so much fire as the timing of inundation um, for that species. So, you know, it's, it's, everything is sort of unique, I think, in the way that they interact with fire and water. But I, I would say most species are going to do better if they're not inundated shortly after they're, they're burned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and you've got a couple of questions in the chat as well, I think, here, which I'm happy to read to you if you want, but, or you can just take a look. Yeah, so somebody asked about burning, um, you know, well before the wet season, wouldn't that increase the risk of, of fire control? Cause that's during the dry season. Um, yeah, certainly we plan our fires well in advance. Um, I would say more so in the Everglades than many other places. And so they're looking for weather conditions to be appropriate for burning. We often get, um, you know, rain events or, you know, weather, a series of days that, that um, are wetter during the winter when it is okay to burn. Um, they were burning just, I think, two or three weeks ago when I was down in the Everglades. 
So there are some winter windows for burning when we aren't increasing the risk of control problems. Yeah, and it is crazy how you can get hooked on prescribed burning. <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Crandall? Pablo, you've got your hand raised. Pablo, I think you're muted if you're, if you're talking. Oh, I'm really sorry. Thank you. Thank you first for, for your talk. Um, and, and I, just wanted to know if, if you study also like flowering patterns, since I know that at least for sand hills, there, there's a lot of theory linking flowering patterns to seasonality of past five years. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's funny you should ask that. So uh, Mary Nell Armstrong, who's a master's student who just graduated last December, studied season of fire and the effects on flowering, seed production, and then germination of those seeds. Her interest was really in, you know, what can you collect? If you're collecting seeds in November, which is typically when you would collect seeds for restoration projects, what are you getting in it? And will you get more seeds that, you, that will germinate if you collect from multiple seasons? And what she found in a nutshell was that if you burn during the growing season, I believe her burns were in June, you see just a synchrony of flowering. And we've seen this in past studies in the literature, but some of those species, not all, but some of them actually don't produce seeds that germinate when you burn during that season. So if you're collecting seeds for restoration, and this was the, I mean, is what she studied, then you need to collect from multiple burn units because though some other burn units may produce fewer flowers, they are producing the seeds that germinate. Well, thank you. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. And her thesis should be available through UF. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you again, Dr. Crandall, for coming in, and I think that was just fascinating. Um, as, a, as a sociologist, I know almost nothing about fire ecology, so it's very educational for me. Um, but yeah, for everybody else, um, I encourage you to check out um, Ecology on Fire, uh, the website there. Um, and definitely note um, Dr. Crandall's email if you do have follow-up questions or, or want to talk any more about this. Um, and for students, obviously, if you have questions or concerns or anything before next week, please feel free to get in touch with me anytime. Otherwise, I just want to thank everybody for uh, coming in for Dr. Crandall's talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.